When an RNA virus like a coronavirus needs to replicate, it has to replicate its own genome. And to do so, it must encode its own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is because our normal host cells can only make RNA from a DNA template. If it can't replicate its own RNA genome, it can't be packaged into new virion particles, and therefore we can't get new infectious virus being made. So these viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, or RDRP molecules, represent a potential novel target for antiviral drugs to work upon. We know remdesivir works quite well in culture, but currently we're lacking the important clinical trials in humans to know how well this drug will work in controlling this new coronavirus infection. Hi, I'm Dr. Megan Stain, and welcome to my masterclass. Today we'll be talking about the virology of SARS coronavirus 2. SARS coronavirus 2 is a newly identified member of the coronaviridae family and is the virus responsible for COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 19. Coronaviruses have a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome, which is non-segmented. That genome is wrapped by nucleocapsid proteins, which arrange themselves in a helical fashion. This is encapsulated within a lipid envelope. The virions themselves are between, 20, between 70 to 120 nanometers in diameter. When we visualize these virions under an electron microscope, we can see these characteristic spike proteins of the virus emerging from that lipid envelope. And that gives the virus these typical corona or halo around it, which is how the coronaviruses got their name. Prior to 2002, we knew of two coronaviruses which circulated amongst the human population. And these were typically responsible for the common cold or mild upper respiratory symptoms. However, there was an outbreak in China of an unknown of unknown cause with patients reporting an unusual pneumonia and this was termed a severe acute respiratory disease. The virus responsible was then identified as a coronavirus which was termed SARS coronavirus. This virus spread for approximately one year, infected over 8,000 people and resulted in over 770 deaths, giving it a fatality rate of about 9%. However, good public health measures meant that the outbreak was contained within a year. Subsequent to finding that coronaviruses could cause such severe pathological disease in humans, sparked an interest in investigating what other coronaviruses might be circulating in the human population. And consequently, two other human coronaviruses were identified, which again could be attributed to causing mild upper respiratory conditions in otherwise healthy humans. Then in 2012, another new novel coronavirus was isolated, which was again responsible for causing pathogenic uh, respiratory symptoms. And this was termed Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. It was found circulating in the Middle East and found to be introduced into, the hu into humans from infected dromedary camels. The camels would show some signs of disease as well, meaning that they're unlikely to be the true natural host for this virus. Most of the transmission of this virus was from camels into humans, with some limited human-to-human -human spread, mostly within hospital settings, because the transmissibility of this virus doesn't appear to be particularly high. However, it's caused over 2,500 infections so far, and over 860 deaths, so has quite a high fatality rate, somewhere between 20 to 40%. Then in November of 2019, again, there was a novel outbreak of pneumonia amongst patients in the Hubei province of China. And again, a, a coronavirus was attributed to be the cause of this disease. This was termed SARS coronavirus 2 due to its similarity to the original SARS virus. And the disease has now been termed coronavirus disease 19. Exposure of our mucosal surfaces with infectious virus can initiate infection with SARS coronavirus. So that is the virus getting into our oral or nasal um, mucosal tracts or into potentially into our eye. When this happens, that spike protein on the outside of the virion 
looks for a protein expressed on a host cell surface and it is known as the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. Both SARS-1 and this new SARS coronavirus 2 utilize ACE2 as an entry receptor and computer modeling and biophysical experiments have shown that the affinity for the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein is actually higher for the ACE2 protein than it was for the original SARS virus. And this is thought to contribute to the increase in transmission ability of this new coronavirus. When the spike protein on the outside of the virus contacts the ACE2 receptor, it's then thought that another host cell membrane protein, a protease, is required to actually cleave the spike protein. This results in a conformational change or a shift in the uh, arrangement of the spike protein and facilitates the fusion between the viral lipid envelope and the host target cell. This allows the virus to inject its nucleic acid genome into the host cell and thus begin the process of the infecting the cell. Once the viral genome enters into the target cell and initiates an, it can initiate an infection. Because the viral genome is a positive sense RNA strand, to the host cell, this looks like messenger RNA or the messages which DNA use to tell our cells how to make protein. So the host cell actually uses this viral RNA as if it's mRNA and uses it to make viral proteins. In essence, the host, the host cell is tricked into making viral proteins to help this foreign invader. These viral proteins then go on and essentially take over the host cell. They set up viral factories within that host cell, the sole purpose being to produce new virus particles. The viral genome has to get replicated and new viral proteins then assemble and allow the assembly of new viral virion particles, which can then leave this infected cell and go in search of new target cells to go and infect and then begin this process all over again. The mean or average interval time between infection with this virus and then the onset of symptoms is thought to be about four to five days. The initial symptoms vary in infected people. You can have asymptomatic individuals to cases with severe or mild to severe disease. The symptoms that have been reported include fever, a dry cough, headache, dizziness, shortness of breath, muscle and joint pain, a loss of taste and smell, as well as gastrointestinal symptoms, including diarrhea, loss of appetite and nausea. Typically at five to six days post-symptom onset, the viral loads will peak, and after that point will begin to decline. However, this is not always the end of disease for some patients. In severe COVID-19 disease, the patients will progress on to experience an acute respiratory distress known as ARDS. And as this occurs typically eight to nine days post-symptom onset, when we know that the viral loads are actually falling, we think that this uh, disease is actually can be attributed to the host immune response against the virus rather than the virus itself. It's thought that the immune system goes a bit haywire, causing a cytokine storm, and that this can actually be responsible for um, severe disease, including multi-organ failure and even death. Patients who are elderly or have comorbidities such as hypertension and diabetes are at an increased risk for this severe COVID disease. The tropism for SARS coronavirus 2, or what cells it will infect, is thought to be dictated by the expression of the ACE2 receptor. ACE2 has been reported in nasal and oral mucosa, as well as on pneumocytes from the lung, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, enterocytes, and renal tissue. We can see in ex vivo tissue samples from um, human samples, basically, that have been infected um, ex vivo or out of, outside of the person. We can infect them with SARS coronavirus 2 and look for which cells become infected. We can then look for the presence of viral proteins in the cell with an antibody and use that as an indicator to show us what cells become infected. The studies have shown that we can detect infected cells within the bronchus, the lung, as well as the conjunctiva from the eye. In terms of transmission of the virus, because it's, we know that it's replicating in the respiratory tract, we believe that when infected patients cough or sneeze, or even just through talking, they can release drops of saliva, which can be potentially loaded with virus. Those droplets containing the infectious virus can remain suspended in the air for a period of time, and people who are in close enough contact can inhale these infectious droplets, which can initiate a new infection. 
Alternatively, if those droplets are actually acted on by gravity as well, so will fall out of the air and contaminate surfaces around an infected individual. If an infected individual also doesn't use good respiratory hygiene, such as coughing into their elbow, and instead coughs on their hands and doesn't wash them, they can transmit the virus from their hands onto objects that they touch. A new susceptible person can then touch those same objects which have been contaminated with virus, and if they then touch their face, such as their eyes or nose or mouth, they can set potentially inoculate themselves with the virus, initiating the infection. We know that SARS coronavirus 2 is highly transmissible and efficiently spreads from first person to person. This can be due to a number of factors. Firstly, it could be that very few virus particles are necessary to initiate that infection. We know, for example, for norovirus, that as few as 20 virus particles can be enough to establish the infection. Currently, we don't know what that infective dose is for SARS coronavirus 2. It could also be that these infected individuals shed loads or huge amounts of virus when they cough, sneeze, or even just speak. Um, but again, we're lacking suitable studies to allow us to determine that. We can measure the viral load in people, that is how much of the viral RNA we can detect in their samples, such as the nasopharyngeal swab. However, this doesn't always seem to correlate with how severe their disease is. Again, asymptomatic people can show the presence um, of viral RNA in these samples and they can be potentially spreading the virus. This is, can be a huge issue for trying to contain the virus and limit transmission as potentially there's people out in the community infected, but feeling otherwise well and shedding infectious virus to new susceptible individuals. It's also important to note, however, that just because we can detect viral RNA, it doesn't mean that there's necessarily the presence of infectious virus. We know that dead or dying cells could potentially still harbor viral RNA, but be no longer capable of producing infectious virus. Or there could be infectious virus there, but it's able to be effectively neutralized by the host immune response and therefore not enough to go on and establish a new infection. We also know for the original SARS virus that we could detect viral RNA well after infectious virus had been cleared from the patient. However, we're still lacking effective studies for this new coronavirus to allow us to establish how long people may continue to shed RNA but no longer be infectious. Because of the severity of SARS coronavirus 2, there's obviously also a lot of interest in developing specific treatments against it. And remdesivir has been suggested as a potential antiviral agent and has shown good of efficacy in uh, controlling the viral infection in studies in vitro. Remdesivir is what's known as a prodrug. So when it's administered, it becomes actively metabolized inside a cell to an active molecule. When an RNA virus like a coronavirus needs to replicate, it has to replicate its own genome. And to do so, it must encode its own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is because our normal host cells can only make RNA from a DNA template. So these viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, or RDRP molecules, represent a potential novel target for antiviral uh, drugs to work upon. The active component of remdesivir actually binds quite nicely into the RDRP molecule from SARS coronavirus 2. It's taken up and it looks to the RDRP as if it's an adenosine molecule or one of the building blocks of the RNA, but it's really not. And what happens is when it gets taken up by the viral polymerase, it actually prevents new then bases getting added on to the growing RNA chain and results in what we call chain termination. So this effectively blocks an important step in the virus life cycle. If it can't replicate its own RNA genome, it can't be packaged into new virion particles, and therefore we can't get new infectious virus being made from these cell infected cells. So as I said, we know remdesivir works quite well in culture, but currently we're lacking the important clinical trials in humans to know how well this drug will work in controlling um, this new coronavirus infection. The early results from clinical trials have mixed results reported, and unfortunately, there have been some um, adverse effects reported as well. An important feature of that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase also is that when it's copying the viral genome, is it will frequently make mistakes. Uh, and this is what we see in many RNA viruses and why they have a huge diversity, such as what we see for influenza and HIV. 
These viruses, the polymerase often lacks a proofreading function. So it doesn't actually check that the copy of viral RNA that it's made is identical to the template and is prone to making errors and inserting single base pair changes into the genome. So therefore, every time the genome replicates, there's a potential that a nucleic acid here and there will be changed. For coronaviruses, they're quite unique in the RNA viruses in that they do have some proofreading ability. However, um, they generally are still prone to some, making some errors as they go. The result of this can be that we end up with the emergence of, of isolates from different patients having a slightly different nucleic acid sequence. Currently, there's studies underway to whole genome sequence, lots of patient isolates from COVID-19 patients. This can be useful to help us track the, tra when tra track the transmission of the infection throughout the population. And we can assemble or put all of these genomes into what we know as a phylogenetic tree. And they allow us to visualize how similar or different isolates from different patients are. It's important to note, however, that just because the genetic information from the virus changes, this won't always result in any phenotypic change to the virus. A single nucleic acid substitution in the RNA code won't always change the protein. And even if it does, a change to that protein won't necessarily change the function of the virus. So far, it's too early in the epidemic to know if we're going to see the emergence of different strains circulating and if they will have different biological properties because of this change in nucleic acid.